tuatahi rā, te kana kia mihia, te hau kāinga. The first acknowledgements go to the, to the home people, Taranaki Whānui, um, Te Atiawa, Ngāti Tama, Ngāti Mutunga, uh, me ngā kāranga ranga hapu, uh, marae, uh, iwi o tēnei rohe. Uh, nō reire mihi ana kia, kia koutou o tira uh, te hau kāinga ko a karanga hia nei tēnei huhuinga i tēnei rā. So I just want to first acknowledge uh, all our um, local iwi, uh, te Atiawa, um, Ngāti Tama, Ngāti Mutunga, and uh, the many other uh, iwi and hapu from Taranaki Whānui, uh, from the side to Tai Hauauru, uh, and mihi atu ana kia koutou, uh, calling this hui uh, here in Taranaki in, in New Plymouth, nā motu uh, i tēnei rā. Um, ki ngā maunga whakahi, uh, ki ngā maunga tike tike, uh, kua tatu mai nei ki tēnei, te maunga titohia, arā te maunga o Taranaki, e, e karanga nei uh, ki a mātou, I uh, just want to acknowledge all the mountains in the room, uh, your own maunga uh, from wherever uh, you hail from, all the mountains converging here on Taranaki maunga, uh, the other name for Taranaki Titohia, um, uh, which is a mountain which has called us all together today. Uh, so so uh, yeah, big acknowledgements to the local people uh, here in Taranaki. Uh, for calling the sui uh, here in New Plymouth, nā motu uh, i tēnei rā. Uh, but uh, kei ngā mā tāwaka, kei ngā hau e whā, uh, everyone from all over the motu, um, the four winds of Aotearoa, the many canoes that have come uh, together today, uh, tēnei au e mihi ana ki a koutou uh, no mai haramai. Uh, welcome uh, to this uh, Beef and Lamb uh, AGM uh, meeting uh, today. And uh, we've, we've got a big agenda in front of us, um, but uh, in terms of uh, tikanga Māori, um, we, we, we like to acknowledge our, our local people, and uh, secondly, to acknowledge those that, that have passed on uh, from the last AGM, he nui ngā mate, nō reire ngā mate haere, haere atu rā, hoki atu rā, ki te kā puni puni wairua, to the place where the, uh, the spirits converge, ki te mūngo te tangata, to the place where there's Silence, ki te haumumu tango te maria, to the place where the, the spirits uh, go. Ki reira o ki o ki ai, and there to be rested. And so I acknowledge all those that have passed on um, over the last year. And uh, those that have, uh, you know, kua taumaha i tēnei wā. And so uh, te tai toke rau, uh, te tai rā whiti, and uh, my home in uh, Hawke's Bay, um, to Wairua uh, that have been uh, decimated with the, the recent flooding, uh, Cyclone Gabriel, uh, e mihiana, e mihiana kia rātou, e taumahana, those that are, uh, are heavy burdened at this time, uh, to acknowledge all of those uh, people. Uh, but uh, rātou kia rātou, uh, tātou kia tātou te hunga ora, uh, huri no te koutou katoa. And so I um, just want to welcome you all here uh, to this meeting. Um, in a traditional manner, and um, uh, we're, we're grateful that you've taken the time to be here uh, today, and uh, looking forward to uh, uh, the many discussions that we'll have. Ko waio e tūnei, Baden Barbers, my name, I'm the uh, Independent Director on, on the Beef and Land Board. I hail from Ngāti Kahungunu. I'm also the, the Chair of uh, the Iwi, uh, Ngāti Kahungunu. Yeah, so uh, it's, it's a real uh, privilege for, for myself to come from the Te Tairawhiti over to Te Tai uh, the West Coast, uh, to be uh, manakied by our, our local people. And so acknowledge all the people that are from Taranaki in the room. Uh, tēnā koutou, te kaha manaki mai nei, uh, i uh, So with that, I'm going to give us a, a, a karakia uh, to open up our um, proceedings today. And then we have a, I think we have a waiata that uh, the Beef and Lamb staff are going to I'm going to uh, sing. Okay, so I'm going to I'll give our karakia. Uh, kia te mata pai ai tā tātou de hui tēnei rā. Uh, nō reira, <coughs> e te atua kaharawa tēnei ki mātou, e, e mihi atu nei ki a koe, te tima tutango tēnei hui hui ngā tau. Uh, nō reira, e pā, uh, uji mai tō wairua tapu, hei, hei arataki a mātou nei mahi, hei tēnei rangi, a mātou nei kōrero, o mātou nei uh, whakaaro. Kia te tiki pai ai uh, ngā mahi o beef and lamb, uh, o tira mō ngā kaipāmu, uh, huri nō te motu. 
Nō reira, tēnei mātou te, te mihi i atu nei ki a koe. Me nāki tia mai i a mātou o te rau o tātou nei whanaunga. Ko a pākino nei te huripari Gabriel. Ko a waipuke tia ngā whenua o Aotearoa nei. Kia puki ai te ora ki a rātou. Ho eno ki a mātou e huihui mai nei tēnei rā. Tauria te ngā whakaaro ki a koe. Kia timata pai ai tēnei huihuinga. I rungi te ngā tapu o hi karaiti. Tō mātou kai whaka ora. Āmene. Kia ora tātou. So, um, uh, this, is a, this is a brand new uh, composition, this song. Um, it was, uh, it was uh, composed with the help of the staff at their uh, staff wānanga. Yeah, so uh, I, I, I haven't actually heard it myself, so this will be a, a, a new, um, a new uh, kaupapa. But uh, it, it's, let's roll it out, people. song but the, the, the bottom is a whakatauki toitu te whedua whatu ngaro ngaro he tangata o ngaro noa he tangata the land remains, people come and go eh? people come and go uh, but the land, ka toitu te whenua, uh, it remains it will always remain and I think uh, oh there you go uh, the, the, whaka, the whaka pakea tanga o te, te waiata but I think um, for us as uh, Primary sector farmers, um, whenua is, is, is really important. Uh, whether you're Māori Pākehā or otherwise, you know, the whenua, toitu te whenua, let's manaki the whenua um, so that it can continue to provide mō te tangata. Yeah? And even though that we come and go, uh, hopefully our land will remain. Uh, Kura te, te whakaaro nui. Uh, nō reira, nau mai, haere mai, piki mai, kake mai, tēnā koutou, E nā koutou, tēnā huiwi tātou katoa. Thank you, Baden. Good morning, all. Uh, could we open the doors in case anyone's lurking around outside as well? Welcome to the beautiful New Plymouth, the capital of the West. Did you know... New Plymouth has the highest turnover McDonald's store in New Zealand and as recently as 2021 won the world's most livable city award. Now, if you don't take anything else away from today, these are a couple of fun facts you can share with your friends. My name is Christine Christensen and I'm privileged to be the current chair of the Western North Island Farmer Council for Beef and Lamb New Zealand. I'm a proud Southland girl from the land, who has made the Manawatu home, where, with James and our three kids, I'm a small-time beef farmer with a big-time passion for our industry, and I'm pleased to be your MC for today. 
So we'll start with some safety notices. In the unlikely event of an emergency, a siren will sound continuously. Please leave the venue immediately by the nearest exit, so the green signs, and assemble on Courtney Street or in the car park at the front of the hotel. If the emergency is an earthquake, don't attempt to leave the building until the shaking has stopped. Keep away from all the glass and shelter under doorways or tables. Uh, drop, cover, hold and get cosy. For first aid, see any of the beef and lamb or hotel staff. Hopefully we don't need any first aid. Um, toilets are located on your left along the conference corridor and also on your right just off the rocks lounge. And this is a non-smoking venue. For those of, um, for anyone that's not here and aren't aware, there's a live stream link available to register for on the Beef and Lamb website. So share amongst your networks. Now your annual meeting uh, pack should have been received when you checked in. If you haven't checked in, please make sure you do so um, by seeing the team at the registration desk ASAP. And in your packs, you'll have today's agenda, the minutes from last year's annual meeting, a summary of the company resolution and farmer remits, Beef and Lamb New Zealand's annual report, a snapshot of recent work funded by farmers' levies and a bit about the Kiwis Backing Farmers campaign. Now we're running to a very tight schedule today, so can I ask that during our morning tea and lunch breaks you return to your seats as soon as you're instructed. Uh, Brian Hawkins, Chief Musterer. If you have any specific dietary requirements, please speak to one of the hotel staff. We'll have a quick break at 10.15 uh, before we move into the annual meeting and the formal part of the day, including the remits. Lunch will be at 12.45 and we'll be straight back into it at 1.15pm. Uh, following the conclusion of the annual general meeting, refreshments will be served and then a barbecue and informal gathering will occur at 4.30pm in the garden area uh, to our left. Our Western North Island Farmer Council is diversely rich in skill and talent. And unfortunately some can't be here today due to district council commitments, business commitments, and our old mate COVID. But our WNI farmer councillors in attendance today are Bevan Prophet, Hamish Blackburn, Graham Fergus, Lydia Cranston, Matthew Hanson, Stacey Buchanan, and the Mayor of Tarata, Brian Hocken. Could you all just stand, please? Thanks. The Western North Island Farmer Council has been planning this AGM and showcase to host on behalf of Beef and Lamb for three years. And now that we've got the pandemic behind us, we really feel like we've struck the jackpot with this day. In no other year would we have had the privilege of having so much energy in the room. We thank you for turning up, engaging in our organisation, and we look forward to the discussion throughout the day. For those unaware, there is no farm trip to Matarata Downs this afternoon. Thank you to the Hocken and Coogan families for offering to host this visit, but the process of the AGM takes precedence. As a farmer council, we are disappointed not to be able to showcase our amazing, progressive and forward-thinking farming region. However, we welcome each and every one of you to come back any time and we'll be pleased to host you and your farming colleagues. In the Western North Island Farmer Council, an overarching value that we hold and act on is respect. Respect for others' views, respect for our farming network's input, and respect for our organisation's vision. Today, we're all here to reflect on and formally ratify the previous year for our organisation. And as Chair of the Host Region, I thank the levy payers that have submitted the nine remits that will be discussed today. It is important for our organisation that such discussions are had. I urge all of you in this room to demonstrate respect throughout the day for each other's views, for the time allocated and for the process that is constitutionally bound. We're going to start the day with two panel discussions. The first brings together some of the, most, of the best scientific minds in the country who are helping address some of the animal health challenges facing our red meat producers. 
And the second panel discussion will look at consumer trends and the work Beef and Lamb New Zealand is doing to position the sector to capitalise on these trends. So firstly, I'd like to invite Dan Breyer to the stage, who will facilitate the first panel, along with panel members Nick Sneddon, Axel Heiser and Ginny Dudansky. Welcome all. Thanks, Christine. Cool. So I just wanted to take this opportunity now. Thank you for having us. I wanted to take this opportunity to highlight and focus on some of the people that we've got working on um, the problems on behalf of farmers. Our, our industry is underpinned by excellent science, as you know, and excellent science requires excellent scientists. Um, so it's, it's a real pleasure to be able to um, have them along today to talk a little bit about their work and, and hopefully answer a couple of questions from you as well. First off, I'm Dan Breyer. I'm the General Manager of Farming Excellence with Beef and Lamb. And so the, the areas that I work at roughly is uh, behind the farm gate. So research, uh, product development, and, um, and genetics is a, a really big part of that as well. So before we get to these guys, though, one of the really important things we do is decide what we're going to do research on. And so I just to cover off how we collect that information, there's a series of steps we go through and, and places we get it from. First and most importantly is our Farmer Council. So we have each year at the Farmer Council annual meeting, we survey our farmers. Um, we do that quite um, casually, um, but, we, but it's really important information for us that we pull together, collate, and look for those common themes coming through. We also have a Farmer Research Advisory Group, a FRAG, uh, and they work with our science team to give feedback as that research is going and as that's happening. Paul Crick, uh, who's here, is, is the chair of the FRAG at the moment. And we also collect information uh, other ways from our farmers. So we, a really interesting one, last, over the last few years we've had a project running called the Hill Country Futures. And one of, piece of that has been a survey, in-depth interviews, sitting down at people's kitchen tables of over on nearly 300 farmers and, and people close to farmers. And so we've got this incredible data source of things which are important to farmers, what's important to their business and their sustainability. And so that's helping feed um, the questions that we're trying to answer as well. Outside of that, we obviously use our other beef and lamb network. So we've got our, our survey, um, people like Mike out there talking with farmers. We have uh, the work that Nick and his team are doing in the markets and the trade to look to the horizon and see what those new options and, and um, risks are. So all of that comes together. We, we pull it together and um, then we might go and ask scientists to answer questions uh, that we have uh, or they'll come to us with ideas and it'll match in with those. So, so it's, really, it's a really robust process um, and really important for how we decide how to invest best levy. So that farmer voice is, is so crucial there. When we do that, there's two or three things that always bubble to the surface. So we hear a little bit about greenhouse gas and we, we hear a bit about farmer resilience and um, forages, um, but three things that always come to the surface, parasites and parasite resistance, facial eczema, um, and dairy beef, the integration of dairy and beef systems, which is why we've got these guys here today to talk about the, the work that they're doing in those areas um, and hopefully give us a bit of insight into um, how we're going to solve those. So firstly, I'm going to start with Axel. Axel is the chief scientist and leads the animal health solutions team at, at AgResearch. Axel's research revolves around understanding the role the immune system plays in the body with uh, work in developing novel diagnostics and vaccines. Uh, he's also interested in how food can strengthen our immune system. So Axel, um, do you just want to, have you got a microphone there? Um, do you just want to tell us a bit about yourself and about the work you're um, progressing? Yes, of course. Thanks, Dan, and thanks to Beth and Lem for inviting me. Um, I'm Axel Heiser from Egg Research, um, German by birth, as you probably have heard by now, um, but Kiwi by heart. Um, I used to do cancer immunotherapy research and then for me to come back to New Zealand and work here for good um, needed to change into animal science and so 12 years ago I joined Egg Research and have been working on immune health in livestock and um, wider animal health issues, developing diagnostics, um, vaccines, 
And that led me to work with the team at Beef and Lamb to start thinking about what we could do um, around fish and eczema. It was shocking three years ago, and we built a huge program now that receives $20 million of investment um, to really throw everything that we have on the science side at fish and eczema. Looking at the genetics of the fungus, looking at the toxicity, looking at the ecology of the fungus, what we can do with pastures and, and other fungi and, and um, endophytes to bring it under control, looking at better spore count methods, looking at earlier diagnostics for facial eczema to find the subclinical cases and potentially treat them, looking at what the rumen does to sporidesmin and if we can introduce a probiotic to break it down and detoxify it, um, maybe make a vaccine that neutralizes sporidesmin. So this is really a big program that, that we um, are starting just now and I have received the first samples from some of you um, that have kindly agreed to help us to set this up. Um, the idea is for two years to do some very fundamental science to figure out a few things that we don't know and we know shockingly little about facial eczema. Um, and then the, the next phase will be to define two interventions that we can offer as a solution, probably one pasture based, one animal based. And then at, towards the end of the project, we bring it on farm and work on adaption and, and convincing everybody to do it and, and the benefits of it. So that is, for me, a very, very exciting project for, for the coming years. Yeah, that's Thank really you. cool. So, so we're getting underway this year and um, playing out over the next seven, yeah? Yeah, awesome. And you've also been working um, up until now on a novel test. How's that work going? Yes, so we... Um, AgriSearch is providing the, the reagent for the Remga test um, that probably a good number of you is using to, to breed for FE tolerant or, or resilient animals. Um, and we were not happy with the animal welfare side of, of this approach. So the idea was to develop a test that we can do in a test tube and not in the animal. Um, that comes towards the end of the project and we think we have a handful of markers that we can read off a blood test that might give us an option to replace the REM gut test. I'm very careful about this because I know there's a lot of excitement around this and we still have a way to go to turn this from something that works in the lab to something that works as a screening test um, for all of you at a cost that is not um, unsustainable. But yeah, I think we're getting there. Yeah, that's really exciting, right? Um, that, that's probably the most exciting piece of research in facial eczema in 30 or 50 years. Right? Yes, no pressure, thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah very good. Yeah, so, so no, no pressure. Um, cool, thank you. Um, and we might come back, Axel, if there's more questions or um, down the track, so thank you. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Dr Nick Sneddon from Mass University. So Nick has a PhD in animal breeding and genetics. Uh, he has worked in both the sheep and beef sector and the dairy industry in New Zealand. Nick is the science lead for our uh, Beef and Lamb New Zealand's Dairy Beef Progeny Test, uh, which is run up in, in, the central, in the central plateau. Nick, um, our dairy levy payers are always keen for us to think about dairy beef integration, and particularly that uh, vexed problem of the bobby calves. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing? Hey, um, so, sort of go back the same way as Axel. So, uh, originally from Tokoroa, so also central plateau, not far actually from where the animals are. Um, so, yeah, came off a dairy farm, but early mornings aren't my thing, so went into animal breeding, because the animals will be bred at any time of the day, they don't have to be at like five o'clock in the morning. Uh, so that led me into that. Um, spent time in the dairy industry, where I actually set up Fonterra's genomics lab, um, and then decided academia was actually sounding pretty good again. So went back to Massey um, about a year ago, and picked up the dairy beef progeny test as science lead there. Um, so I've been working on that for a year. Um, so actually quite interesting. So in that there's a big dilemma, which is for the dairy industry, there's sort of three traits that are 
important for them from beef animals. They want gestation length, calving ease and birth weight. So they want to make sure that when they get a cow and calf to a beef bull, that they'll be able to get a calf out of it at the other end and that it's not going to be any later than it would have been if it was a dairy site, which is a way to sort of reduce the number of just pure dairy, low genetic merit, which won't become a dairy cow um, animals. But then there's the other, so those are all really easy to measure traits, right? You both go out on the day the calf is born, you weigh it, you take a punch out of it, its ear so you know who its father was, and you then work out what date that semen was put into the cow, you know how long it's gestated for. So two traits, really easy, you've weighed it, if the cow didn't need assistance, the calving ease is there, and you know how long it was there for. But to take it through to the beef side, you want to be able to make sure that that animal is going to mature in time, it's going to finish well, it's got good meat quality. But those all have a lot more environmental effects occurring on them. So we're now into cohort nine is currently in cows. So they'll be born in uh, July, August this year. And we'll be able to measure those three traits again immediately. We'll know which bulls to suggest to dairy farmers for their side. But those animals are going to take another two years before we know the traits of interest for beef farmers. So we won't know uh, eating quality until they're slaughtered because it's very hard to measure eat, eating quality in an animal and then measure it again for its growth rate the next day. Um, not, not many people like you going and cutting a leg off a cow uh, or taking a bit out of its spine to work out whether the meat's soft. So a lot of those traits are terminal. You can't measure it on the animal and then breed from it because it's no longer there to breed from. Um, so we're looking to use some genomic information in there as well. So we now have uh, SNP panels from all of the progeny calves. We know who their mothers are. We have DNA from them. We know who the fathers are. So we can do some genomics work in that space. Um, and then now we're starting to make sure that we align with both um, beef farmers and dairy farmers through survey work and making sure that the traits that we're measuring are the traits that people are interested in. So there's no point us going out and saying, look, this animal is going to grow at you know, X amount per day. And actually what they want to know is, is it going to be finished before the second winter? So it might grow really fast, but if it's a big animal at the end, it's still going to take two winters. So what are the traits of interest? And then once we have a trait of interest, we can define it and we can measure it and we can start getting genetic gain in it. So that's pretty much where I've been sitting. Um, that's, that's cool. Uh, so a, a um, question that I often get when I talk about the dairy beef progeny test, um, what's the best breed to be putting over these animals? <laughs> Whichever one you like. Yeah, um, exactly. I mean, it's the same with dairy cows, right? So people ask, what's the best dairy cow? And it's the one that fits your system. So we've got to make sure that we get a bull beef animal that is going to match both the system the dairy farm is using and for some, that'll be Hereford, some that'll be Angus, some it'll be Simmental, Limousin, Red Devon, Speckle Park, whatever they want. But it has to meet their system, and then it has to meet the market that's asking for it. Yeah, cool. Uh, what, I like, what I really like about the dairy beef progeny test is actually the number of breeds that are going in there means that some of these sorts of conversation around what is the best breed um, has been put to bed a little bit, right? Like there's, there's bulls across each breed who will solve your problem, depending on what your problem is. Um, Figure out what your problem is and then find a ball to match. Yeah, like, um, so a lot of farmers go, dairy farmers go to a Hereford because it's really easy to spot them in the paddock. You know, it gets up, it's got a white face. You know, that's obviously my beef calf. Um, and then they go, well, I don't really want Angus because I've got crossbred cows and all my calves are black. There's no difference between visually, if you're just picking up, you know, 80 calves in a day, a crossbred calf and an Angus cross calf are going to look very similar. It's not until you start looking for horns or looking at the colours of tongues and getting a bit more in-depth that you find out stuff. Um, so, yeah, finding markers, finding ways to select for it um, and making sure you match those systems up is quite a challenge. But I think currently the top five, top five bulls come from four different breeds. Yeah, absolutely. Choice, thank you. Um, thanks, Nick. Um, and finally, um, I've got Jenny Dudunsky. So um, Ginny, as a local, she tells me, went to primary school here in New Plymouth, so um, she's probably possibly well-known to uh, some of you. Um, Ginny is our Wormwise Program Manager. Um, she's a well-known, highly regarded veterinarian, working hard on the problem of parasites that are resistant to drench. Um, and just before Ginny starts, if you're not aware, Wormwise is a sector-wide approach to parasite resistance that was started 
20 years ago. Yeah, 20 years ago. Um, driven and, and fully funded by Beef and Lamb New Zealand. So, Ginny, um, what's on your mind? Thanks, Dan. Um, and I feel um, a bit overwhelmed being called a scientist sitting next to these two. I'm very much a gumboot scientist. Um, have come out last year, came out of sort of 20 plus years in rural sheep and beef practice, um, you know, in the trenches. Um, and throughout that time um, had been involved in a lot of farm systems and advisory work, um, recognising very early on that most of the issues that vets deal with are a consequence of the farm system rather than, um, yeah, we were treat, always treating things at the bottom of the cliff, so I prefer to work at the top of the cliff. So um, parasites have always been a massive interest of mine, um, and so when this role to manage wormwise came up last year, I just thought I've got to do that. Um, I'm one of those naive people that thinks they can actually make a difference <laughs> um, and, and really hope that um, in the last sort of eight, nine months since um, I've had this role that you may have actually noticed wormwise a bit. Um, while wormwise was released in the early 2000s after the National Drench Resistance Survey back then, um, given the data that we've got now that suggests that probably a third of, of sheep farms that are doing any testing have got triple drench resistance, I would suggest that wormwise hasn't necessarily been all that successful. <laughs> um, and we need, to, we need to just look at every single way that we can um, help farmers utilise the information in, in ways that are practical for them. Um, and want to emphasise that um, wormwise is not just about managing drench resistance. In fact, if we can set up or, or work towards farm systems where, where drench kind of doesn't matter anymore, where we're, we're able to, to, to use a lot less drench, um, then drench resistance isn't an issue. That sounds a bit pie in the sky probably to a lot of you. Um, but, yeah, um, you know, going to some of the other work that Beef and Lamb is funding, um, there was a really cool piece of work done last year, which we, Wormwise will extend a lot more out of this um, as the next couple of years go on, but it was called the Low Drench Users or Low Drench Use Project. Um, and again, really in-depth interviews with farmers around the country who, are, who were identified as using a lot less drench than the average for their district and how they're doing that. Um, and so, yeah, just fascinating. I was sitting with one of them at breakfast, actually, and I would dearly love to get around all those farms in the country and just spend a day with them and actually look at what they're doing because I think... In the end, these wormwise messages um, haven't necessarily always been taken up um, because it's perceived to be either experts lecturing at me or, you know, well, that's all very well, you know, for you to say, but that won't work on my farm. That won't work on my farm. That's probably one of the most common things I've ever heard. Um, and yet, um, if we can help um, sort of get the stories of these farmers out in terms of what they're doing, these farmers are in Northland where, you know, homonchus is rampant all year. Um, some of them are intensive bull systems. Um, there's just fine wool sheep. Um, all of those, all of those stock classes that you think, oh, jeepers, you know, we th those need a lot of drench. Um, there are farmers out there managing them well enough um, to use less. And I guess the other question people always ask is, um, is any new drench? You know, when are we going to get a new drench class? Um, and I can't guarantee that that won't happen. We were completely blinded by Zolvix and StarTech when they came along. Um, having told you all for 20 years that nothing was coming, boom, we got two new ones. Um, so something new might come along. Um, the issue that we have now, though, is that these highly drug-resistant worms, the ones that are resistant to three families and even now four families with identified strains that are resistant to the new drenches, they just, whatever you throw at them, they seem to be just quicker at developing resistance. You know, we've got farms that have developed resistance to those novel actives within 18 months of their use. Um, we don't know exactly what it is about those worms. They've obviously developed some specific, non-specific mechanism, maybe, um, to sort of pump out whatever you throw at them. So we've, we've lived and farmed in an age now since the 60s where it was really, really easy just to deal with worms by picking up a drum or something and, and shoving something down an animal's throat, giving it an injection. We are getting to the point in some of our systems where just doing that as our approach to worms um, is, is we're on a limited time frame. We're getting down a pretty narrow alley with that stuff. So, yeah, Wormwise is, is all about the farm system, really, and I hope that over the coming years you'll hear more of that. 
Um, the next big, you, you'll have seen our social media, hopefully. Um, the next big thing is um, reinventing the website um, so that it's a, uh, I've got a question about worms. I put it into Google, and the first thing that comes up is the Wormwise website, and there's a direct answer to my question. So rather than the website being this 1998 textbook of, of everything about worms, um, that it's, it answers your pain points. So I want to know, should I be drenching my use before tapping? Put that in, boom, here's some answers. These are the things you should think about. Um, so that's, that's the next big job. Um, yeah, and I do 20 hours a week wormwise and 20 hours a week of my own consultancy, so I feel like I should probably be doing 60 hours a week wormwise, but we'll get there. We'll get, we'll get there, we'll get there. Um, yes, it's a full week, it's fair to say. Um, and so, so you mentioned too this morning around uh, how you're trying to help farmers access you know, different, different segments, if you like, of what people, people, the workshops versus the other pieces. Right? Oh, yeah, good point. Um, so some of you may have seen uh, surveys on social media last year about beef and lambs parasite resources. Some of you might have answered them. Um, the answers to those surveys were really useful to us. Um, only about 25% or so of people who answered those surveys said that they wanted to get their worm information um, from workshops. So workshops have been the main kind of thing that Wormwise has done for 15 years, so that was good information. <laughs> um, the other really interesting point out of that was, and I'm always weary of this answer, but the answer farmers give when you ask them where they want to get their parasite advice from, the answer is always vets. 70% of farmers said, they would rather get their information from vets. Um, and that's a consistent finding, and I'm never sure whether it's I say that because that's what I should say or, or that's what I think. Um, but regardless, it keeps coming up as the answer, and we something that surprised me after I'd been in this role for a little while was the I thought I was viewed as reasonably independent, even though I was working for a big vet company. Um, the the scepticism with which you farmers, you know, view some of the advice that you get from your veterinarians because of the tie-up with retailing, and I get that, um, but I wasn't aware of the depth of feeling on that. Um, and so one of my big things um, is, is to, one, get more training out to other people who retail drenches and other people who give farm advice but also to try and standardise the messages that are coming out of the veterinary industry. So I can't do that by waving a finger at people. Um, but what we have done is we've set up a discussion forum for vets um, about parasite management. Um, so every day at five o'clock, if you're a member of sheep and beef vets, dairy vets, deer vets, and anybody else who wants to join, um, you'll get a thread in your inbox as to what discussion's gone on on that forum each day, um, what questions have been asked, what cases have been put up, um, I'm always on that forum. The difference with that forum is I've ad been able to add Dave Lethwick, um, Andy Greer from Lincoln, um, Bill Pomeroy and Ian um, Scott from Massey University, parasitologists, and a few other key people like that um, who can really contribute those science-based and research-based answers. Um, and that's been amazing. Dave Lethwick in particular deserves every bit of credit that anybody gives him because he will answer those things within 24 hours in full with a huge amount of information, and I really, really hope that, that this is going to change kind of the conversation and the landscape of how vets get their information, because one of the criticisms Dave always makes is vets only get their information from drug companies. Well, here's your chance to change that, and, and Dave's doing a great job, so I really hope in a few years this, this uh, inconsistency of information that you guys perceive coming from veterinarians will, will change. That's my great hope. Very nice, cool. Um, and, and Dave, you know, Dave's a great example. I was just thinking of the people working on these problems for us, right? So we're, we're lucky to have you guys here today, people like Dave Lethwick, who've invested their career essentially in helping us solve these sorts of problems. Uh, Dr. Derek Moot, who spends, who's had a really big part to play in the Hill Country Futures Programme uh, and was out working with our farmers the other day. Uh, Jason Archer, who was hoping to come up. Um, Dr. Jason Archer, who's, um, you know, sought out around the world for his knowledge on... Um, on animal breeding and applied uh, use of indexes. Michael Lee, who's un who's, who um, Michael Lee makes new science most weeks uh, on how our, gen our genetic evaluation works in sheep. Um, so we're just we're, we're really lucky and privileged as farmers to have these guys uh, working on our behalf. And um, we've got a few more minutes. Um, any questions uh, from the floor?
Uh, Nels Henson, uh, Taranaki. I'm um, Meat and Fibre Chairman for Federate Farmers. Um, I'm going to be a bit provocative because I like, um, we're, a, we're in the Beef and Lamb Survey and um, I study the Beef and Lamb Survey and I um, am concerned that historically, for the last 30 or 40 years, the average sheep and beef farmer has only put on the best year ever of fertiliser is 27% of maintenance. That's industry-wide for the sheep and beef sector. And when I look at what we've achieved over 30 years with lifting Olsen peas, we've almost doubled our pasture production. And 35 years ago, when I was at Massey doing an ag science degree, subdivision and fertiliser were the major threats. If you weren't doing it, you weren't succeeding. And it's almost like, with respect to your all, three of you guys, you, I mean, we've got breeding and we've got eczema. Eczema can be a huge problem in a bad year, and worms are a constant problem. But if the average sheep and beef farmer was growing a third more grass every bloody day, we would be actually um, achieving a lot more as a, as, a, as, a, as a group or as a community. And it, and it bugs me that we're not actually brave enough to tell the average farmer, we'll do a survey of 300 farmers and, and they'll say, oh, I want to know a bit more about bloody worms or bulls. None of them want to hear that actually you could put a few more fences up and put a bit more fertiliser on and you could double your production. And that's, I can get that from having a glance at the beef and lamb survey, which has been going for 70 or 80 years, but we feel like that's too big a question and we don't want to tell our farmers Actually, there's some stuff you could do tomorrow, invest in your farm and your infrastructure, and these guys are the icing on the cake. And I would just like you guys to tell me, do you agree? Like, what you're doing is important, but there's some fundamentals that we're getting wrong, because I, in my community now, a 600-acre farm is a hobby farm. You know, we're, we're losing people. We talk about pine trees being a problem, but actually... Our, our, our EBIT of 300 compared to the third top guy doing 700, that's the fundamental biggest challenge for sheep farmers. And I'd just like to see whether your panel would um, acknowledge that. Completely agree with you. Um, in the rest of the, from my personal perspective, in the rest of the week, when I'm not doing wormwise, I'm doing farm consultancy and people get me in because they think they have a problem with worms or they think they have a problem with sheep production or whatever and it always comes back to that stuff. Um, it's those basic, that science that we've known for years and years, the subdivision, the fertility, the water, the water in the, in the western North Island, um, that's what we end up talking about. We barely end up talking about worms so I hope, Niels, that you'll see as Wormwise grows and goes on, that a lot more of the information is actually about farm systems. Um, because if we get the farm system right, the worms, they, they never go away, they're always going to be there, but those farms that perceive that they have big worm challenges, actually they have a farm system problem. So totally agree with you. Uh, and I'd agree too, right, and that farms are systems. Um, the, these guys are working on, and we're talking here about particular issues within those farm systems, but your job, your guys' jobs as farmers is to pull all of these things together and make it work on your bit of dirt. Um, in terms of the feed production stuff, that's that's exactly what Derek Moot's been working on us, uh, working with us for uh, in the Hill Country Futures Program, which is about how that dry land hill country um, stopping to not using um, nitrogen in particular. So, so there's pieces of work that we're doing in that particular pace. Um, but yeah, I agree with you, right? Farm production and farm profitability is largely driven by feed production. And, and feed conversion. It's also a fascinating piece of social science about why people don't do yeah. what they know they should do. Um, you know, that stuff about Olsen P and subdivision and water, if you ask anybody, they'll, they'll, they know that. Um, what, what, is, what, is, what is stopping it? Um, it's just a really, really interesting piece of work. <laughs> and maybe telling stories of people who've, who've done it and, and made changes and, and improved things as, as part of it. Um, thanks, Jenny. Hamish Spelsky here from um, South Otago, sheep and beef. Um, ex or two, so I grew up here. Um, 
What I learned when I was up here is that if you gave a long acting drench to a lot of your use over a long period of time, it was about 10 years, 10 to 15 years, and you had drench resistance um, at a stretch. What well, I'm finding down south, we've got flocks that are blanket long acting drenching their whole flock, and they've been doing it for about 15 years, no problem. And so when we discuss this, 30% of farmers now have got drench resistance to three. Um, families, most of the people we talk to down south say, oh, it's a North Island thing. So uh, please, can you just elaborate on that um, re survey, on its distribution, and a little bit more about that, because we're, we're just excusing it away at the moment. Yeah, good. Um, okay, so your first point about um, the farms in your area that have used long-acting products and used for a long time and yet don't have high levels of drench resistance, I think there's two things going on there. One is the lower number of worm cycles that happen in a year in the southern part of New Zealand. So whereas uh, north of Taupo, um, pretty much, unless we get dry, um, the worms are cycling all year. So there's just more scope for those worms to be selected every year and screened out by the drench. Um, whereas in, in the South Island, it might be half that or even less sometimes. Um, the other, with, without knowing too much about the farm systems, I suspect that um, in general lamb growth is better, faster, quicker because you guys don't have all the bugs um, and you're probably not holding lambs for quite... Lambs are your worm contaminators, they're the worm multipliers, um, the longer that lambs are on and dragged through autumns and winters, um, particularly if the autumns and winters are warm and growthy, um, then you've got more scope to keep selecting up resistant parasites. So I think that's the background to the pattern that you're seeing. Um, the question about the distribution of where that data comes from, there were actually more of those tests. This is data out of Gribble's veterinary pathology, 102, I think, sheep reduction tests that were done last year, and more than half of them came out of the South Island. Um, certainly that, um, you know, down into Canterbury, um, I, I can't tell you the regional distribution in the South Island, but what I can tell you is talking to colleagues in certainly Canterbury anyway and Marlborough, um, you know, plenty of, of cases of worms that are surviving your triple drench. So it's not just worms that are resistant to each drench individually, they are surviving the triple drench. Um, but I agree with you, talking to vets further down south, they are not seeing that rampant triple drench resistance. Lucky you. Yeah. Um, although the, the, some of the, the more worrying resistance in cattle are showing up down in the South Island as well. Cool. Um, that's that's probably us, I think. Um, no, 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 no. Oh, sorry, Graham. No, thanks, Dean. Right. Graham Gleeson. Gra Graham, Graham you'll be the last question. Okay. So I'm Graham Gleeson. I'm from uh, Waipa, South Waikato. Um, I farm in a very hot, iffy area. We will have very variable spore counts from 30,000 typically, uh, but we'll spike over a million. And uh, I can see the challenge that we'll have trying to find some sort of solution towards that. You know, we've been breeding with ram guard for many, many years. You know, it's a long, uh, long road uh, to get that tolerance. But my question is really to Axel, and it'll cross over to you also, um, uh, Nick. Uh, so that's the correlation with ryegrass staggers. Now, back in our early days, uh, having low tolerance, we used to get a lot of ryegrass staggers. And our flock was used as part of Chris Morris. Is a, uh, he's passed away now, but he was from Ag Research. And he found that correlation with ryegrass draggers and facial eczema. Are you and your research today still looking for that correlation? Are you extending it uh, somewhat just to incorporate that? Because with the dairy beef program, I can see you know, ryegrass staggers is going to be a continual thing. If we believe in climate change and whatever and warmer weather, um, you know, those sort of problems can stifle, limit our farm systems. Yeah, no, that, that is, question is not part of the program as it is planned currently. Um, we're open to change our plans if we think it becomes important, but the, the, one of the main things, I think the solution for facial eczema will be on the pasture. There's something in New Zealand that is different from the rest of the world, and that's why we have the problems with facial eczema. And my bet, although I'm an animal scientist and would love to have a solution on the animal side, I think the solution will be on the pasture by changing our pasture composition, 
or changing the way we manage our postures. That's, I think, where the, where the solution is going to sit. Um, the, we, we have done some pilot studies on, on, for this, and we've already found that there's not one species of fungus, but probably several. Some make spores, others don't. Some spores have spore adjustment, others don't. So we have to rethink the whole, the whole approach. Our spore counts might be, might be high, but not containing spore adjustment. So there's a lot of work for us to do on the, on the pasture side of things that I, I think will give us a solution. Staggers is not part of that yet, but as I said, we might rethink that in the years to come. Thank you. Cool, thank you, Graham. Um, thanks, everyone. Thank you uh, to the... Oh, sorry. I say, um, the, the problem from a genetics perspective is you've got to have a group of animals that are exposed and express both. So it could be that our most facial eczema resistant animals genetically are in an area where there's no facial eczema. So they'll never show the phenotype to be resistant to it. So we can't select from them because we don't know which ones they are. And then if you want to select for them, you've got to expose them to it, which comes to the animal welfare side of things. And then that group to find out if there's a genetic correlation or anything happening within the animal to cause that correlation, they've then got to express grass daggers as well. So whether it becomes a metabolic pathway that's resulting in how they metabolize zinc and magnesium, being the two minerals that I can think of that would cause both of those. So that's a problem there. Um, but to come back to the fertilizer one, um, most of the time when I talk to farmers, I will tell them that, yes, we can help you breed better animals that will grow faster and do better. But that is in that current environment. If you change the environment by increasing pasture production, they will be able to express a greater amount of that genetic potential. So from genetics, we just continuously build the base on which pasture will show stuff. So you will get to a point where genetics is advancing, but the environment is holding the animal back, and you won't see genetic gain. There will be genetic potential there, but until the system is changed or modified, they won't express it. Yeah, cool. Really good point. I and mean, we've seen a lot of that in the dairy industry, right? Um, cool. Right. So this time, thank you very much for your, uh, for your input, uh, and thank you for your guys' time. Thank you for, for listening. I think that we've got a video to show of, um, so some video now, so this was taken a few weeks ago just looking at some of the research and extension work that uh, Beef and Lamb is involved with, so we'll let that roll. So I'm Erica Van Reenen from Ag First. I was a co-author in the Economic Evaluation of Stockwater Articulation and Hill Country Report. It's really important that we've got levy investment into reports like this that um, support farmers with tackling some of these big challenges, um, realising the benefits of systems like these, um, but also understanding some of the risks and opportunities such as the environmental aspects. So having that levy power investment just means it's really accessible. Um, it's not just about the report, but actually getting it out there and sharing that information widely with farmers. The informing um, beef, beef program, I'm looking forward to seeing it progress. Um, one of the benefits of the program is going to be the improved breeding values or, or Pacific to New Zealand. And I think that's a, that's a big thing, having uh, more accurate information. Commercial farmers can, can relate to it a, a lot easier, um, is, is the hope and the intention. Currently what I'm looking for is, is to keep a, a moderate, um, moderate cow size for my genetics. Um, sort of, yeah, we, we, we need easy calving, but, and also moderate growth, um, but also um, IMF is one thing we've been following a little bit, and, and some posit and positive fats. Just want a good, easy doing animal, really. I think the program going forward is, is actually just gonna change how we can stick things, or improve, improve that information. So, yeah, looking forward to it.
Uh, yeah, we're in the Wanganui area, and um, yeah, we definitely have seasonal challenges. Facial eczema is um, quite a big problem on our place. Uh, the local vet club does quite well with giving us four counts uh, weekly. That information we work out um, a plan of attack, whether it be using bullets or spraying paddocks out. Notice a little bit that beef and lamb's doing a fair bit um, in this area, which is real, real good for us. Um, you know, it's a massive issue. Um, yeah, so yeah, the more we can get out of it, the better. I did the Generation Next program in fielding mid-2022. I really enjoyed it. It was a great opportunity to learn and, you know, start looking into the further side of farming rather than just shepherding and, what you know, get the brain thinking about other stuff. I'm a shepherd at the moment and I've gone back on the family farm and hoping to take it over one day, so I thought it would be really good to go through it and... Um, yeah, it was going to help me to progress in my career. Like, my ultimate goal was to move up into the management side, so obviously just doing the stepping stones into that, and I thought that was a good, yeah, way to start thinking more about the book side and all the other stuff as well. I learnt lots about the financial side of things, and, um, yeah, so much of that I've even gone home, and just, like, the practical side of things for um, stock, set stocking and rotations that I can now apply on the farm. Beef and Lamb, Generation X programme, it was a bloody good programme. I've been involved in the programme for the last uh, 10 or so years, um, facilitating programmes across the top of the South and Lower North Island. And I guess one of the things that, that I see from an extension programme is its consistency, um, not, not only in terms of the ability to continue to bring new things um, to farmers through these field days, but also in terms of the number of farmers that continue to come to these events, and, and that really just highlights the, the value that they're getting out of attending, the information updates, um, the stimulation that they get from the, uh, the ideas that are presented, um, and obviously they go away and think about it and how it applies to their own, own operations. The programme um, provides an opportunity for farmers to socialise, and uh, I guess given... Um, you know, recent events and, um, you know, the, the challenges that farmers have faced over the years and will continue to face going forward, um, those opportunities uh, that are created by the uh, steering committees um, are a great vehicle for farmers to come together, get off um, to the fat and just, um, you know, talk about uh, what's going on on their farms, uh, their lives um, and share their experiences. Um, it's great. There's always something to pick up either on farm or um, with your speakers and your different presenters. There's always something to get. And um, I think, well, I've come from Danny Burke, so we've just been hammered in a pretty good storm. So it's five days of working pretty hard and um, nice to get off farm and to see how others are doing it. Bevan's obviously had a hammering here and storms of the past and um, it's just nice to see how he's recovered. Yeah, I come out from the Hawks Bay to get away from the mud too and have just a reset day. Get out on the farm and just enjoy people's company. Yeah, we were all up and running again in our business, so it was time to go and have a break and have a, have a nice day out on the farm and see what New Zealand farmers are up to. Yeah.